Yeah, Alex's comment uh, this morning about John Maynard Keynes' comment on uh, <clears throat> the uh, sleazy uh, lie perpetrated by the Bank of England reminded me of something Murray Rothbard once said. Uh, Alex men mentioned that uh, uh, Keynes called this uh, action by the Bank of England uh, a masterful manipulation, and he was sort of celebrating it, wasn't he, Alex? And <clears throat> Murray, in one of his writings, in an article called Just War, said a masterful politician is a masterful liar, conniver, and, and a manipulator. And, uh, and, so, and it, anyway, maybe, maybe Keynes had run across that somehow, I don't know. But, uh, and uh, the politician that Murray was referring to this was Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, and we, we often have uh, people at these conferences that sit in the back and they take bets on how long it will take me to mention Lincoln. <laughs> and so, and so, uh, so uh, let me know who, who won the bet. Uh, my, my talk, All States Are Empires of Economic Lies, I'm going to start out by saying, uh, expressing my agreement with Doug Casey, who wrote this about uh, the economics profession of today. Most economists are political apologists masquerading as economists. They prescribe the way they would like the world to work and tailor theories to help politicians demonstrate the virtue and necessity of their quest for more power. Then he goes on to say, the field of economics has been turned into the handmaiden of government in order to give a scientific justification for things the government wants to do. That's uh, Doug Casey. And Joe mentioned uh, yesterday that there was sort of an evolution of economics from, uh, and, and quoting Mises, from the days when we were sort of the, always the, the skunks at the picnic in terms of in the eyes of the statists. <clears throat> but now we're sort of, uh, uh, not the skunks, but the, the caviar being served at the, pic, at the picnic. So I mean, we're, we're, we're the, the apologists. Uh, but this, this has been going on for a long time. Here's the founding document of the American Economic Association in the 1880s. Said this, the state is an educational and ethical agency whose positive aid is an indispensable and condition of human progress. And it also said this, the doctrine of laissez-faire is unsafe in politics and unsound in morals, end quote. Then it also mentions sort of a Marxian class conflict being the, a big issue of the day, and then economists needed to weigh in on that. And so all of this, uh, you know, to, to add another quote from Murray Rothbard about the role of the, uh, the intellectuals, and including the economic intellectuals, he, he reminded us that, quote, the majority must be persuaded by ideology that their government is good, wise, and at least inevitable. Promoting this ideology is the vital social task of the intellectuals. And unfortunately, that is the vital social task of most of the, uh, the, uh, the economics profession. And of course, the Austrian school is uh, the big giant gorilla-sized skunk at the picnic, uh, as far as that goes. And I'll give you, you know, one example. I'll use sort of a uh, Rodney Dangerfield language. Uh, take the Fed, please. <laughs> it, you know, uh, one, one of his bad jokes was, take my wife, please. Uh, 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 and Larry White, who's an Austrian school economist, wrote an article a few years ago, found that 75 to 80 percent of all publications on monetary policy are written by people associated with the Fed in some way, either employees of the Fed, they attend conferences, uh, they're interns, they get paid in some way by the Fed. Milton Friedman once said this, quote, if you want a career as a monetary economist, it is best not to criticize the major employer in your field. That's pretty good career advice, I would, I would think. <laughs> I would think. Uh, Joe Biden recently said this, and I'm quoting, it's not Milton Friedman's Fed anymore. And, and he, he's certainly right about that. There was a survey by uh, the Independent Institute, uh, their journal, the Independent Review, uh, did a survey of political affiliations of Fed employees. And they found that for every one Republican, the Fed, Fed economist, there are ten, 10 Democrats. The Board of Governors, the staff, not just the board, but the, the, the staff, they employ a lot of economists. Uh, uh, 97 Democrats and two Republicans. Okay, the leadership positions, the vice presidents, senior vice presidents, and all that, of, of the, the Board of Governors, of their many, it's not just the board members, they are, they are, it's a big bureaucracy. 45 Democrats and one Republican. 
Uh, and here's uh, another example of what, what the Fed is about. The New York Fed homepage says this. This is the New York Fed. Uh, we have a desire to root out the intolerable inequities and injustice grounded in systemic racism. Steadfast in our commitment to work for a more equitable economy and society is our goal. That is socialism. Isn't that a good definition of socialism? Uh, so Joe Biden was right. It's the one thing I've heard him say in his whole life that is right. That, that it's, it's not, it's not, uh, not Milton Friedman's uh, uh, Fed anymore. And... Um, and of course, the Fed is now doing all sorts of uh, research on climate change and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and all that stuff. It's become basically another uh, uh, Democrat Party DC think tank, uh, basically. And so, and you know, way back in the 1940s, Mises wrote that universities of his day he called them nurseries of socialism. And so this is, and it's gone downhill since since then, in my opinion. And so uh, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to give some examples of what the mainstream of the economics profession has done, what, what they have taught uh, to teach these lessons uh, of the status in the economics profession. And I'll start with one, you know, the most successful uh, economics textbook from 1948 until about 1988 was Paul Samuelson's Principles of Economics. Uh, and, and most of the other books that were sold during that time were carbon copies of Paul Samuelson's. They pretty much said the same thing. They just had different authors' names on them. And so there wasn't much of a choice. It wasn't until the 80s. I actually published an article in Policy Review magazine in, in the 80s uh, on the, the, the textbook revolution because there, are, there were a few textbooks, finally, that had a more free market focus uh, to use. But here's, here's, how, here's what Samuelson taught generations of students about the Fed. Uh, and, and he describes the board of gov people at the Board of Governors of the Fed as sort of a, a combination of Jesus Christ and Albert Einstein. <laughs> the Federal Reserve's goals are steady growth in national output and low unemployment. Its sworn enemy is inflation. <laughs> so I guess you have to take, a, take an oath, sworn enemy. Yeah, I'm fine. If aggregate demand is excessive so that prices are being bid up, the Federal Reserve Board may want to slow the money supply, thereby slowing aggregate demand and output growth. If unemployment is high and business languishing, the Fed may consider the in increasing the money supply, thereby raising aggregate demand and augmenting output growth. In a nutshell, <clears throat> this is the function of central banking, which is an essential part of macroeconomic management. And, you know, a bigger bunch of baloney was never spoken, I, I would say. But you have to write things like that to win the Nobel Prize in economics. That's uh, Paul Samuelson. This is the same Paul Samuelson who, in the 1988 edition of his textbook, predicted that by the year 2000, Soviet GDP would exceed American GDP. 1988, he, he said that. Okay. Uh, some other examples. Uh, at the time, the American antitrust laws were enacted. The first one was 1890. Uh, Jack High and I published an article in, the, in an academic journal called Economic Inquiry. We had surveyed the entire economics profession of that time, which was very small, but not like today. And they were unanimously opposed to the whole idea of antitrust regulation, which they thought was inherently uh, incompatible with, with competition. They thought it was a block on competition. And, but uh, shortly thereafter, the so-called perfect competition model was invented. And, and economists uh, used to think of competition like the Austrians do, this dynamic, rivalrous process of entrepreneurship. And, and so it wasn't a static system. And then they invented this, this funky new theory that uh, competition meant uh, homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, uh, 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 perfect information, uh, free entry and exit, all these, this never-never land world of economics. That's taught for generations. And so this utopian ideal that could never be achieved was, uh, for decades was compared to the real world. And of course, everything compared to utopia is imperfect or failing. 
And so the whole big literature of market failure being pervasive was created by the economics profession pretty much in the 1930s is when it really took off. And it was called the Nirvana Fallacy by uh, Harold Demsetz, a UCLA economist, comparing this crazy utopian model to the, the real world. Of course, everything in the real world is imperfect. Nothing is perfect on Earth. And, and that led to the whole denunciation of capitalism. When they invented the theory of monopolistic competition, which I always thought was an oxymoron, kind of like jumbo shrimp or military yeah. intelligence, you know, you know, um, you know, monopolistic competition, you know, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the markets had not changed at all. Markets were the same, but the theory of markets had changed, so they used that to denounce it. On price cutting, if, uh, what students were taught, if you, if you cut your price, you may be guilty of predatory pricing, and the government will come after you. If you raise your price, you may be accused of monopolizing an industry, and the antitrust people will come after you. If you keep your price the same, you might be colluding with your competitors, and you might be sued for antitrust. And that's, what, that's another thing generations of students were taught. Okay. Public utility monopolies are natural, meaning free market. Big lie. Uh, read my article, The Myth of Natural Monopoly, in the Review of Austrian Economics from years ago. There was vigorous competition in all the public utilities, telephone, electricity, and, and everything else. And it, didn't, it first came into being in Baltimore, of all places, where uh, the, uh, the Baltimore Gas and Light Company struck a deal with the state legislature. They said, give us a monopoly and ban competition, and we will give you 15% of revenue, you the state, 15% of revenue uh, in, in perpetuity. So it was a, it was a loot sharing uh, uh, program. And then all the other states said, wow, that's a good idea. We can, we can raise taxes, but then blame the company. We can blame the utility company for the, for the higher prices of utilities. And, and so it went. So there's nothing natural about natural monopoly, but they still teach it today in the textbooks. Pollution is caused by profit seeking. Who, do, who hasn't been taught that? And uh, another article of mine that was written after the collapse of communism, we learned that uh, the worst pollution on planet Earth was in the socialist countries that had outlawed profit seeking. <laughs> and so there's got to be something more to it than, uh, than just profit seeking as a cause of pollution. Uh, <clears throat> not so much today, but back in my day when I was in school, I was, when I was taught the free rider problem in, in, uh, in microeconomics, uh, I was taught that uh, a good example of why we need taxation to provide public goods was we spend far too little on national defense. Okay. Hold, hold, hold your uproarious laughter, please. <laughs> we, we, we spend too little on national defense. I even have an old friend of mine, uh, I won't mention his name, he published an article in an academic journal saying, well, in praise of corruption, and he said, because of the free rider problem, we spend too little on national defense. So when you read these stories about Pentagon corruption and lobbying by the defense contractors, that's a good thing, because they get us closer to efficiency. You know, it's, that's, that's the way economists uh, uh, th used to think about this. Then, of course, if you took macroeconomics, you're taught the magic of the multiplier. The, the balanced budget multiplier, if the government takes a $1 billion from us in taxes and then spends $1 billion in the ways it wants to spend, the magic of the multiplier says GDP might be 1.5 or 2 billion or more. Now the logic of that is that we should send all of our income to Washington DC and it'll come back at 150% or 200%. We'd all, we could all be rich if we just, Send every penny of every paycheck to Washington, D.C., and the magic of the multiplier will, will take care of it all. Uh, there have been Nobel Prizes awarded for something called asymmetric information. That's what causes markets to exist. We have different information, and we, and we interpret different information about the value we place on things. That, that's, that's why markets and capitalism and civilization exist, is asymmetric information. It's another word for the division of knowledge. In the knowledge-based economy, we used to talk about the division of labor, but in the knowledge-based economy, the, the division of knowledge is the same thing. And that's what we rely on. That's what makes our system work. And here we have people like Joe Stiglitz uh, winning the Nobel Prize uh, uh, for this. 
And uh, one of the one of the men that sh- shared the prize for this was Janet Yellen's husband. He's a Harvard Harvard uh, professor, and his famous article was uh, was uh, was about uh, lemons in the car industry. He predicted that the used car market. This is 1970. He predicted the used used car market would disappear because uh, used car salesmen have more information about the cars than the buyers do. And but at the time, warranties existed, 30 day warranties. And so, uh, and so that problem, if it was a problem, was already taken care of by warranties at the time. And he writes this article and he wins the Nobel Prize for it because, it was, because even by 1970, they were struggling, the statists were struggling to dream up new, new types of market failure. And this was, this was a big celebration for them because, aha, we thought of a new one. And you know, a new, new reason for even, even more crushing interventionism in, in, in markets. And so uh, see, that's another, another myth. Paul Krugman, who was mentioned earlier, uh, in, um, in, in the Time Magazine, August 16th, 2011, uh, this was, we're still feeling the effects of the crash of 08. And Krugman, he was serious. He was serious. He said, if, if the government were to start telling uh, stories about a, a potential uh, space alien invasion, That would be a good thing. He said this, if we thought space aliens were going to attack, this slump would be over in 18 months. Because of a big jump up in military spending, military Keynesianism. You know, if we thought there was a threat from outer space, that's that's why they're constantly saying, you know, Putin wants to conquer the world. There's always another Hitler around every corner, around every tree, isn't there? You know, peeking around every tree according to the, the military establishment. And, and Krugman is, of course, one of the worst. And of course, after 9-11, Krugman also, I used to have this on my office door, a New York Times article with Paul Krugman. You wouldn't think that a guy like me would have a, a Paul Krugman, Krugman column on his economic office door. But, uh, but he said this, the silver lining of 9-11 is that all the rebuilding will boost the New York economy. Another Nobel Prize winner from MIT, like Samuelson. Yeah. Tax, students have taught tax loopholes are inefficient. Of course, a loophole is just a tax reduction. It's more efficient to let bureaucrats spend your money. That's, that's efficient. Hand your money over to the government bureaucrats and politicians. Let, let them send that to that guy Zelensky in, in Ukraine. That's more efficient than you, than, than you spending your own money. NAFTA's 2,000 plus pages of regulations written by lobbyists and their congressional staff. See, what I write? Oh, congressional staff for horrors, I wrote to myself here. <laughs> constitutes free trade. The majority of the economists, professors, even the majority of the DC libertarian think tanks, with the exception of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, were pro NAFTA back in the day, back in, in the early 2000s. Only government bureaucrats can solve externality problems. Uh, with all the talk we had this morning about entrepreneurs, uh, there's, there's a group in, uh, in Montana, the, the uh, free market environmentalism is their, is their thing. It's PERC, P-E-R-C, Political Economy Research Center. And for decades, they've been doing studies of how ranchers out in the West and, 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 and people of all sorts of environments solve environmental issues, environmental problems voluntarily. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize, the first woman economist to win a Nobel Prize, uh, publishing how uh, commons problems are solved all over the world uh, uh, without government interference. And so, but but that's, these things are rarely taught in in the in the, in the, the basic economics uh, books. Uh, we're taught that the great De- that uh, the New Deal ended the Great Depression. Well, of course not. It didn't unemployment was still 17 in 1939. And World War II did not uh, end the Great Depression either. It ended unemployment in America because what, what was it, 11 million men were drafted and sent to war. And so uh, you can only believe that World War II ended the Great Depression if you believe in the equivalence of a man having a job, coming home to his family at night, and a man sitting in a, in a hole in, in, uh, in Europe with bombs raining down on his head. Same thing, pretty much, you know, pretty much equivalent. And so it was just ridiculous. And, uh, but the, what really ended the Great Depression was the end of World War II, uh, when the, the federal budget was reduced by two, two-thirds, 
in absolute dollars from 1945 to 1948 and the, because of the great demobilization of the military. And 1946 was the biggest year of GDP growth in American history. 40, 46%, I think, is Bob Higgs gave us the number of, of uh, the private components of GDP, private investment and consumption spending, the, the biggest spurt in, in genuine economic growth in recorded American history uh, came in, in alongside a two-thirds reduction in the federal budget. Uh, that, that's what you would call the good old days. Uh, and, of course, one more thing. I'm kind of running out of time here. Somebody held up a minute... Uh, who held up the sign? I'm the president of the Mises Institute. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when it's time to... Uh, <laughs> he, he, he increased it, see? He wants to keep his job. Yeah, he's, see? I told you we have some really smart students here. That, 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 that's, uh, 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 well, the final, the final thing uh, I'll mention is that uh, too much savings can cause a depression. Uh, and, uh, it's the, the paradox of thrift, that's another Keynesian uh, superstition that was in Samuelson's book, that if we save more, we therefore consume less, and that'll cause GDP to decline, supposedly. And if GDP declines, then we will have less money to save because we don't have as much income from, from that. And so that's supposedly the paradox. So don't save your money. And, uh, and, <laughs> and I, I can remember after the, after the crash of 08, I, show up, I went, uh, showed up in my golf course and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I'm paying, I'm at the desk uh, paying, and I'm paying cash for the green space. Yeah, and there were these two guys uh, sitting next to me that were criticizing me. They said, put it on your credit card. What are you doing paying with cash? And I don't know. They wanted me to, they, they had this idea that debt was a good, uh, good thing. That, uh, maybe I would spend more if I used the credit card or something like that. And, I mean, and they were older than me, and I'm, not, I'm no spring chicken, but these guys were older than me, so maybe they had been thoroughly educated by Paul Samuelson's textbook. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and then uh, they were around the same time, remember uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the evil Alice Rivlin, who was once the, uh, the uh, head of the uh, Congressional Budget Office, was on TV. I turned the TV on, this is after the crash of 08, and she was giving uh, people advice, uh, uh, financial advice, so she was acting like... Uh, you know, one of these financial advisors, and she was saying, go out and spend money on anything. doesn't matter what it is, anything. Just, just spend it on anything. doesn't matter. And, I, and I, I, I showed this to my students in the classroom. I, I got the video and showed it to the students. And I, I would tell them, yeah, like Alice Rivlin's crappy, stupid books. Go out and buy, you know, anything. <laughs> but but, that's, but the, the paradox of thrift was, was the reason why you see these sorts of things. You know, savings is bad. And, of course, the Austrian view is that you, you, you can't have economic growth. Savings has to precede capital accumulation and, and economic growth. And so this is just a short list of some of the things that are still to this day, uh, not every single one of them to this day, but taught by the mainstream of the economics profession. And the Austrian school has always criticized all of this as, uh, all of this, uh, as, as, as pretty much nonsense. And that's why the only, the only true economics anymore is being pursued by not only us, but, uh, but, but the Austrian school, which is why the Mises Institute is more important than ever for the future. And, uh, you know, Murray Rothbard himself uh, thought that he was basically in the business of de-bamboozling because, <laughs> because so many aspects of the academic world are in the opposite business of bamboozling the public, as others have said today. And Mises himself in the human action said that the three disciplines that are the most susceptible to being propaganda are history, law, and economics. And, and so my short talk here is about some examples of the economic version of that. And Mises said that in the 1940s. He was writing, writing about that. And okay, my time is finally up. This man is he's off the hot seat now. And, and <laughs>